This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. If you don't already subscribe to Paramount Plus, please use our affiliate link by going to talkthroughmedia.com slash Paramount Plus. Using our affiliate link gives us a little credit, which helps us to keep bringing you great content. U.S. residents only. Welcome to episode 71 of the Star Trek Discovery Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm Ruthie. And tonight we'll be covering season four, episode 10 of Star Trek Discovery, titled The Galactic Barrier. Before we get started, we want to remind you that we now provide early access versions to our podcast that go out typically within 24 hours of our recording. We're recording this late. Sunday afternoon slash Sunday evening. Um, so goal is to try to get this out Monday morning. So we'll see if I'm able to do that. Um, that will end up being a few days ahead of the regular podcast. So if that sounds good to you, you can help support us by going to patreon.com forward slash Brian and Ruthie to sign up and um, just to as low as a dollar per month gets you access. But first, uh, before we get into this week's episode, we have some feedback for last week's episode and just general feedback in general. So let's open Haley hailing frequencies. Okay. So our first, uh, bit of feedback is a voicemail from Mike in Cleveland. Hey, Brian. Hey, Ruthie. And the rest of my, nerdy, geeky, trekky friends out there. Um, Mike in Cleveland. I um, wanted to drop a note in. I'm an over-the-road truck driver, so I really don't get to keep as current as everybody else is on the current issues. But, you know, I'm watching Star Trek. I love Star Trek. I really love this season. I wish Brian and Ruthie was loving it a little bit more. I wish other people, like my boy um, Jeff, not Jeff, um, the sailor guy, because, you know, I'm a sailor. Ex sailor, so I wish he was loving a little bit more. Um, as far as my boy um, Jeff, X Force Eleven, I, I hope I said that right. You and I seem to watch a lot of the same shows. I know we we both love Star Trek. We both love the Expanse. You know, I I, I love listening to your um, feedbacks. You're pretty cool about it. I'm pretty sure I listened to a podcast you put out there before. It was either um, Supergirl or um, Gotham, one of them two. One of them two you did. You know which one you did. And I love listening to you do it. I love um, following what you've done before. Whatever you're watching new now, let me know. I'll probably watch it too because we seem to have the same taste. But as far as um, Star Trek Discovery goes, I'm loving this season. You know, they seem to have really picked up season three, not my thing. Um, I, you know, I don't love the iffy, wishy, iffy, washy Burnham. I, I love the way they're portraying Burnham now. Kind of interesting to me. You guys may or may not want to talk on to, about it. How, um, every other Star Trek, there's only been two Star Trek captains or leads, in my opinion. And I'm African American, so my opinion might be, you know, a little bit, you know, tilted. But why is it that Captain Cisco? or Commander Sisko, or Benjamin Sisko, however you want to identify with him, and Burnham had to earn their seats while every other Star Trek league was just given their freaking seats. Whatever. Hey, no issues. I ain't, I'm, I'm, I'm not side I nothing. I'm just saying <laughs> it's interesting. But, you know, I've, um, I love Star Trek. It's the only show I've ever watched that I am in a continual to continuous rewatch, you know, even when I'm DS9 and I, you know, I watch they come through this um, feed with um, the revenge and with James and Kim, you know, you know, James and I, I think we're like 
copacetic. We love DS9. Kim, sometimes I love you. Sometimes I don't love you. <laughs> but, you know, I, I love your, your insight. You, you make me look at my show a little bit different, a show I love. But, um, you know, it's killing. It, it's interesting to me how people are coming after Burnham in this series. And I understand and I know 55 years old, I get why some people are attacking her. And, you know, to you people, I say get a life. But to other people who I know are better than that, I I really think you guys should really look at the way you're questioning the show, questioning her and questioning their direction. Because basically she's covering the same ground that um, Captain Cisco had to cover. And she's doing it quite well. I love the show. I love the podcast. I love the feedbackers. I love the, the interest. I have no issues with you people. Let's keep it up. Mike and Cleveland. Bye. Well, thank you so much, Mike in Cleveland. Um, good to hear from you. And uh, I always love to get those like kind of general feedback uh, emails or voicemails. Um, to kind of, I don't know, summarize things as we're going. Um, I would just say first that uh, you and I, Mike, are contemporaries. I am also uh, 55 years young. Uh, so there's definitely some common ground there. I think it's interesting what you said about Burnham and Cisco, how they earn their commissions versus, um, you know, the other captains that we've seen kind of... Uh, we see them already have gained their uh, commissions. Um, I don't know what to think of that. I, I certainly, I like the story of um, these captains earning their commissions over seeing them becoming Captain Picard. Like, you know, we know Captain Picard is Captain Picard because we're introduced to him as Captain Picard. Um, I think it would have been interesting to see him become Captain Picard. Then the same thing with Kirk. And we kind of got that from the movie, so though it was a condensed version um, and a ridiculously <laughs> condensed version. Let's let's take him from cadet to captain in in uh, one fell swoop. But but uh, I don't know. I I don't know if it is you know an African American thing. I don't think so. But I. I like the story of seeing them rise to prominence like this. And uh, that's all I have to say about that thing. But the other thing I was going to say, because I've already noticed this is because when I did it, um, I did a rewatch of the first seven episodes prior to episode eight coming on. And I noticed that I loved the, the half season a lot more than I did watching them episode to episode. And that is, um, has been pretty much the case all the way through, uh, on discovery. So plays better after you watch it. So what did do you have to add to that, Ruthie? Um, <laughs> well, I was going to make a joke that you kind of talk too long. It kind of doesn't make sense anymore, but that's okay. I, I'm not sure about, I, I don't know. I, I don't got anything to say. Okay. Um, it was James, the augmented sailor. I think you wrote down and uh, Jeff did Supergirl, And uh, I believe he did Gotham. If I'm not mistaken, he did Gotham before that, but okay. We also got feedback from, um, it was all part of his feedback for this week, but it, it uh, this seemed to fit more about the podcast for last week, so I tossed it into feedback for last week uh, from Andy from the Midwest. Ruthie, you want to read that for us? Sure. Andy from the Midwest says, I apologize for causing consternation regarding Hold Your Horses and Not Good Enough on the last episode. I know that they're the same thing, and I'm good with that. My thought process when Bryce, Reese, Saru, and Colbert went out on the away mission was, yes, this is good. But then it was written poorly and ended quickly. So I thought, good, but not good enough. 
I had Picard on the brain because I just finished my rewatch of season one, listening to your podcast along with it this time, but I realized I needed to use the appropriate category for Discovery. And also because I just finished listening to your entire backlog of Picard and Discovery podcasts over the last two months. I've heard people confuse and misuse your categories multiple times, so I was just trying to be funny. Unfortunately, you couldn't see my face or hear the inflection in my voice, and my words did not convey my intent properly. So I just wanted to clear that up. (laughs) Well, it was funny, and you can really call it whatever you want. And, uh... Yeah, I forgot about the fact that you were going back and listening to our entire catalog, um, Andy. And thanks for doing that, by the way. We appreciate it. And, uh, you know, hopefully we got better as we go along. Now we have to say, if you're a real fan of us, uh, you can go back and listen to the Walking Dead talk through. <laughs> but uh, anyway. All right. Well, it was... Um, Good to hear from you. Let's we'll hear more from his feedback later on in the uh, episode. Okay, season four, episode ten is titled "The Galactic Barrier," written by Anne Cofell Saunders and directed by Deborah Campmeyer. The description from ParamountPlus.com is as follows: Captain Burnham and her crew must go where few have gone before, beyond the galactic barrier. Meanwhile, Book learns the truth of what drives Ruan Tarka. Uh, The air date is 11 something PM Pacific standard time, February the 23rd, 2022. The runtime was 51 minutes and 42 seconds. And we did not get a star date this week. Um, Ruthie, what would you give out of 10, the galactic barrier? Um, I'm going to stick with the eight range, I guess. Okay. Um, Myself, um, this was an episode that could get a better rating as we go. Um, But, I mean, we'll we'll see. I'm going to give it, um, right now, I will give it an eight and a half. Unexpected Vulcan and... Kelpian dates. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. I did have, I had something better, but right now I can't think of what it is. Um, Ruthie, why don't you start with the listener ratings? We got a few, just a few. All righty. We have Andy from the Midwest who says, I rate this episode an 8.5 out of 10. Will from SoCal says, It was a long drag out, nothing new about Species 10C. I ranked this episode an 8 out of 10. The frontiers are always cool. Wes from Minnesota says, this episode was a little step up from last week. I give this episode 8.75 galactic barrier bubbles out of 10. All right, let's move on to our listener yeses. Well, our yeses in general. Will from SoCal says, Tarina asking Saru to sit down for a first date with his comforting presence, bad self, after she failed to acknowledge his feelings for her in the beginning. Rilak and Michael showing mutual respect for one another. All right. Next, we have Wes from Minnesota, who says, the coupling of Tarina and Saru is starting to blossom. Saru reacting with nervousness over her being aboard Discovery to me felt genuinely hilarious. I agree. That was pretty funny. Yeah. I really liked um, actually watching Colbert watch them. (laughs) Yeah. That was funny. Yeah. All right. That is it for our listener yeses. We only got um, two people contributing yeses this week um ruthie what do you have for yeses this week um i thought that kovich's joke in the beginning was funny oh yes a three-hour tour (laughs) no not just the three-hour tour there was a joke before that oh that one was funny too uh, confirmation bias yeah okay the confirmation bias with the universal translators and the the only guy who laughed was the 
linguist guy. Right. Who I was also enjoying a lot. I wish he were on screen more. Maybe we'll get more of him next week. Yeah. I, I noticed every time we saw him, he was eating. Yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> Dr. Harai, I think his yeah, name was. Yeah, his name was Dr. Harai. But yeah, the three-hour tour joke was also quite hilarious. That was going to be my next yes. Um, I think that's about it. Well, um, we had seen the Galactic Barrier before, so this was a nice update of it. Um, I don't think the Gal- I was trying to look, and I don't think the Galactic Barrier is actually a thing, as far as I know. What do you mean? Like, actually, a thing that is a part of the Milky Way galaxy. Like, this is just a a Star Trek made-up thing, I think. But I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, it'll be on next week's Harata, or uh, Harata, uh, next week's Harata. Um, But... I don't think it's a thing either. I mean, I don't really... I don't think there's anything in between galaxies, just empty space right which was one of the reasons why i was really confused about a lot of this episode well um the galactic barrier was something that we had seen in tos it was um the gary mitchell episode which you may have heard it referred to as that It was like the second pilot um that one they went through the galactic barrier so it was similar. In fact, we'll hear that that episode mentioned later in the um, feedback, as well as the news, as well as the spot the references. Uh, what else? Um, I thought the story of Tarka was interesting. I have more to say about that in my nose, though. And... Um, or it might be in the hold your horses now. I might have moved it around. Um, but um, I did think that the acting on that was really good. Um, I also it was mentioned about the mutual respect. I did like the fact that we kind of got Michael and, uh, you know, Relac working well as a team now. Um, like there's mutual respect. There's um, everything that uh, I was hoping we'd see by the end of the season. We see now. So I thought that was good. Um, and I guess that's about it. I might have more yeses as we go. Um, I've watched this episode quite a few times, but my notes again, weren't as thorough as they could have been. So I may think of things as we go, though. All right. So that's it for our yeses. Let's go on to our no's. Why don't you read the uh, Will's no, and then I'll follow up with Andy's. All right. Will from SoCal says, Ruan Tarka backstory. I didn't care or feel it. However, I felt bad for Oros. Book eating up every Tarka say over the woman he loves. Um, that's supposed to be book eating up everything Tarka says. I think he's trying uh, yeah, to say yeah. he's taking Tarka's side over the woman he loves. I'm not quite sure what you're saying there, Will. I also didn't really care about Tarka's backstory. I was like, meh. Okay. Uh, Andy from the Midwest follows up on the same um, point. So this wasn't wasn't um, in his nose, but he said I could put it there, so I did. And um, in fact, all of the nose have to do with this. So uh, he says. I was happy that they fleshed out Tarka a little more, but I would have preferred to have seen hints of this earlier. I get that people can be really unlikable when you first meet them until you gradually get to know on a deeper level. 
This happens a lot in real life. I dislike some of my closest friends when I first met them, but we've been with Tarka too long this season to have him suddenly pivot like this. Um, I'll take the next one as well. Uh, Wes from Minnesota also has something to say about this one. He says, Tarka's backstory, while it was entertaining, I really didn't care for any of it. And I said, you know, that the Tarka stuff was good, at least, you know, tr- dramatically. But did we really learn anything new? I, I don't think we did, because this is all stuff he kind of talked about. Um, that was my take on it. What about you, Ruthie? I didn't care for it. Okay. What do you have for notes? Um, nothing. Okay. Um, my big no had to do with, um, well, it's not a big no, I guess, but, uh, Bryce and how they're handling that. I, I know why Bryce is kind of n- not there. He had a, he has a bigger role on a different show. Um, but it's just kind of weird. So I'm not really liking how they're doing that and how it ties into Kovic, which is part of my hold your horses. So I'll get more into that in a minute. All right. Speaking of hold your horses, here we go. Hello, this is Captain Tilly. What the heck? Hell. What the hell? Hold your horses. All right. Andy from the Midwest says... All of my yes comments have caveats and alternative viewpoints might nullify my no comments. So I'm just going to put them all in hold your horses this week. Feel free to pull the comments into other categories if they fit with other listener comments in those those sections. Why does the galactic barrier always look like a ribbon that we could just fly over or under? Shouldn't it be more like a shell that surrounds the entire galaxy so that it appears like a wall that extends as far as the eye can see in every direction. This reminds me of cartoons where a character is put in jail, but the space between bars is wider than their body. I hope someone has an explanation because it has never made sense to me, even in TOS. At least with TOS, I could just chalk it up to 1960s special effects. I liked the idea of bringing along a delegation of experts to initiate such an important first contact, although I question the choices of who made up the delegation. It makes sense that there would be experts in diplomacy and first contact outside of a Starfleet Starfleet crew, but shouldn't they have brought more variety since they don't even know how this species looks or communicates? Maybe some telepaths like Beta Zeds. Maybe some synths, if they still exist, in case... Tensi is synthetic, although they do have Zora. Maybe Zora will be important to this. I also think it would have been helpful to bring some non-humanoid life, like Medusans. Just being prepared for any possibility of who species Tensi is and who they might best relate to. I'm curious to see if we will get some payoff to whatever Bryce is doing off the sh- off ship. This is the second episode this season, if I remember correctly, in which he was not with the crew. I just don't know if the actor was unavailable both times for the bridge scene, so they had to concoct a reason, or if something is developing that will be important at the end of the season. Hoping for the latter. Is there a different differentiation between Nelson's and Reese's jobs? I keep thinking that they are both tactical officers, but I assume one of them must be something different. This isn't a criticism. I'm assuming I just haven't picked up on what each of their roles is on the bridge. Um, as far as the galactic barrier, I'm confused about it. Generally speaking, I don't really understand why it's there other than it was set up in TOS, but I agree with you. They should have done a better job at making that seem more realistic. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where, you know, they're kind of, uh, hampered by, what came before and if uh, and if they had done it if they didn't have the past star trek to deal with it probably would have done it differently now i don't see how that can be an excuse though because they've changed plenty of other things (laughs) so (laughs) there i mean 
There's yeah. just no real good reason, in my yeah. opinion, as to why they're doing this. Yeah. This way. Yeah. Um, I want to compliment you. I, I had, um, Andy, uh, I had thought of beta sets um, as like, why didn't they bring beta sets? Because that would have made a lot of sense to me. Like I was thinking, I kept on thinking of Tam Elbrin from that one uh, episode, Tin Man of uh, TNG. Like they need somebody like that, but I hadn't thought of Medusans. I hadn't thought of um, synths and I hadn't thought of Zora. So, you know, it's true. Maybe, maybe Zora plays into this somehow. Maybe the sphere comes from that area of the galaxy. Who knows? Or outside the galaxy. Um, one thought was, you know, maybe the, this is the, the probe from the whales. Um, you know, Star Trek four, maybe that comes in somehow. Um, you know, who, who knows, but, but, uh, yeah, you made some, some good points and yes, they, um, they could have, it would have made more sense to bring in some, uh, some species with some different telepathic and empathic powers to, uh, make communication at least in theory easier. So, uh, the other th thing I was going to comment on was, um, Nielsen is at the, is in the same position as, um, uh, Arium was. Arium was like the spore drive operations officer, I believe is what she was uh, referred to. And that is what Nielsen is. And I think, I think she is kind of at a parallel to, Awashikun, I think like Awashikun is kind of like the ops officer for everything else. And Nielsen is the ops officer for the spore drive. That's how I understand it. But we've also seen her, I don't know, get involved with other things like shields and stuff like that. So there is some overlap between Awashikun and Nielsen and Awashikun and Reese that I've seen. So, uh, do you have anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I don't think so. West from Minnesota is next. He says, why do you have two important women on board, Tarina and Rilak, during this dangerous mission? Wouldn't they rather bring aboard subordinates instead? Uh, well, I don't know. I, like, I don't know why you have to say two important women, um, two important people. Yes. Um, Tarina, I would, I would concur. Like you would think that they would, or she, she would uh, have, you know, could could have picked somebody else. Uh, but perhaps she did it for the same reason that Rilik did. Rilik, however, specifically um, thought that she would be best on board, and I tend to think. That that's true if she's got the 20 years of um ambassadorial experience so that makes sense to me uh didn't trina say the delegate didn't show up so yes. but i think the point was I, I think what wes is saying is even though the delegate didn't show up tarina could have sent you know somebody else um that was there but maybe there wasn't anybody else there, you know? That's kind of what I was thinking. Like, I don't know why you would assume there was someone else when she blatantly said outright the delegate didn't make it. Yeah. I mean, why would you just send a random person? Yeah. <laughs> Especially for something this important. Yeah. All right. Hold your horses. Ruthie, what do you got? I... Did not really like them talking about what they're going to do back on Earth. I felt I thought that was shoehorned in just. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Can you just hit me over the head with a hammer a little yeah. bit? I mean. <sighs> yeah, it was. I've been a little disappointed with the writing lately. Um, Sorry, Mike. I wish I liked it better, too. Um, I don't really. The problem I have is 
it seems like disco is the only ship in the universe or the galaxy, what have you. And I understood that when it was last season because the Federation was semi in a shambles. But once again, it feels like they've painted themselves into a corner where they can't really do anything else. They need to change their formula because this just doesn't work anymore. Um, They sort of got forced into their situation in season two because of the battle with control. It was almost like, yeah, they were the only ship in the universe that wasn't compromised. Um, You know, it ended up that there were other people who also came along to the rescue, but they were sent out on a mission that turned out to be this other, you know, great, big, huge thing. And that made sense to me. This whole premise of, Uh, We're the only ship who can save the galaxy again and again and again. Doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, okay, if what's going on with Bryce is because the actor is otherwise obligated. But uh, it doesn't, I mean, (laughs) out of all the people and all the ships and all of the Federation, he's the only one. And it seems like they do this a lot where... There's no other crew but Discovery. There's no other captain but Burnham. There's no other ship but Discovery. In the whole Federation, for some reason, they are always at the center of everything, always. And that's driving me crazy. Because, it. I mean, in back in The Next Generation, it was these specialists would show up on Enterprise to do this, that, or whatever. It wasn't, you know, this person on the Enterprise is the best, most qualified, most capable. And so therefore, of course, it's going to be him. No, they would have other random people show up and make use of the Enterprise's this, that, or whatever. And I'm just, I don't really get the feeling that we're dealing with the Federation anymore. I was hoping they would solve that problem when they sort of got the Federation back together. But... They haven't, and it's kind of, it's getting old. I don't really like it. Um, it reminds me, we never really talked about this, but it's a Roddenberry show. Did you ever watch Andromeda? No, I never watched Andromeda. Um, what you're describing sounds somewhat like Andromeda. So Andromeda had a lot in common with... Um, with Star Trek and with Discovery, it was a, a ship out of time, and it was the only one. And um, their captain was kind of trying to to recover the Commonwealth, as it was called. So it was the only ship that existed because it was three hundred years after the end of the. Um, end of the commonwealth it's it's similar in that way but you're right in the fact that you know it's like they have painted themselves in the corner that discovery is the only ship and and i get that currently it's the only ship that has a spore hub drive but what i'm hoping is by next season Everyone will have a spore hub drive, or there'll be a lot more ships that have spore hub drives. I mean, why couldn't they? You know, and and for that matter, if there aren't enough uh, Qui Gens around, why can't they either a, you know, get some of uh, Stamets, uh, you know, blood and kind of get some volunteers and um, you know, make some more pilots or. Uh, B, find another species that can communicate with the spores, you know? So. Or C, come up with a different. A different way to pilot it. Yeah. Yeah. No, a different technology other than the spore drive, because it seems like they've forgotten the problem with the using the spore drive anyway. Wasn't there a problem back in season two? There was. And, um, you know, they've mentioned it offhand a couple of times that they've or um, that they've figured out how to not 
ha- not hurt the Josep. That w- it was the Josep that that w- were getting harmed, um, and they figure out a way, but didn't really explain it on camera. Um, but that I mean, that was a, largely the issue there. Yeah, another another technology would, of course, fix the problem. So. I mean, they need to fix the problem because, yeah. yeah, they're the only ship with this spore drive, but I just wish they would have, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Done something different because this is, this is tiresome. I mean, Andromeda was set up to be that way, but yes, and they sort of played like they were going to do that with um, Discovery. But then they immediately found the Federation and immediately solved the problem of the warp drive technology, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I just am not thrilled with the directions that they're taking. What else do you have? Um... I didn't really understand, once again, why President Rillick was even on the bridge. Um, uh, we've already talked about the galactic barrier and how much sense it doesn't make. I didn't really understand why they wouldn't share the information. I mean, what would keeping it secret do? What would be the purpose of keeping that a secret aside from just keeping it a secret for the sake of the secret? I don't know. I didn't understand that at all. I didn't understand why I didn't understand. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There was, wasn't really a point to it. Other than, I think because, Burnham said something about controlling. Yeah, and I think I think something. that's what it was. I think that's what it was. It's like they're trying to control something that they're they they're able to control. That didn't make any sense to me, though. No, as far as no, I mean, okay, I get being out of control and wanting to control something, but I can, I've never been a fan of controlling information like that, I guess. And like, I believe that information should be free. Um, mostly I'm like, I'm not a hoarder of information. If I learn something, I'll tell everybody I won't keep it to myself. Like I'm not, I'm not someone who's chintzy with like things that I learn and secrets. And like, if anybody wants to know, I'll tell them, I'll tell them everything. I won't hold back. So I guess that concept to me is foreign, the, the whole keeping secrets thing. Like, I'm, it's not really my bag. Like, I understand that sometimes there, are, there, there is a need for um, keeping state secrets and such stuff like that. But this did not feel like one of those times. Like, why? why? Why would that make any difference at all to what they're doing at that moment? Can they do anything about it? Can they change anything? Do you think there's suddenly going to be a mutiny on the ship? There better not be for that. I mean, such an idea is kind of ludicrous, right? Like, Yeah, it is. Especially for that reason. Why would keeping something like that a secret have any bearing on how anybody acts or does their job? So, And then I was thinking to myself, um, I know people have brought up in the past about how it's because she's part Cardassian. So I was like, is that why? Like, are they really secret mongers to that extent that that would be why she would want to keep it a secret? I don't know. That didn't make sense to me either, because I was like, I would think in the interest of diplomacy that diplomats would be even more willing to share information than hoarding secrets. So I don't know. I didn't get it. I think that's it. I probably would have put the whole Tarka thing in Hold Your Horses. I can't remember if they talked about it in no, but I was kind of like, meh, don't care. I'm like, uh, you were in a bad situation and you did bad things. I, uh, Andy had it in hold your horses. I had it in no, but it was like a soft no with, um, it could have gone either way. And then we got, you know, two other people that put it in her nose. So it all went to the hold your horses. So, um, well, anyway, I think I can't remember who said it, but it's kind of like too little, too late. That's kind of how I felt too. I feel like I should have learned about this earlier. It would have maybe it would have made me like him more, but 
you've kind of gone to the point of no return with him where I don't trust him. I don't believe anything he says. So to me, everything that comes out of his mouth is suspect because he's proven himself to be that way. So that's why I was like, I'm disinterested in your story because I don't believe you. I don't trust you as a character because we haven't, he hasn't given us any reason. See, my, my take on it with him is I didn't learn anything from it. Like it's all stuff that he's kind of said already. Like he didn't go into detail, but. But we knew that he had been held with the Emerald Chain, and we knew that they were kind of working on like some kind of alternate to dilithium, and that he was being held with this guy that you know became his friend. So there was nothing new there to me. Yeah, that, that was my take on it. So it's true too, and. We still don't know what happened to this guy. I mean, the only thing that we got was a further explanation of what he's calling home. It's not actually his home. It's this place that may or may not exist that he thinks his friend made made it to some alternate universe, which I'm like, I don't know if you ever watched... Um, stargate but there was this one planet where it was like a prison world and they believed that if they stood in front of the um, event horizon of the when the stargate was opening that they would be transported to another place but really what was happening was they were being vaporized (laughs) because (laughs) the event horizon like they like all i can't remember exactly how they explained it but basically when the event horizon opens, anything in its path is destroyed. And um, I mean, to a certain extent, they did create a um, an iris to close over the gate so that people couldn't just show up. Anyway, <laughs> that's kind of what I was thinking is that they were like, that's how the, that's how he was treating it, sort of. I mean, that's how I felt anyway. I was like, this is this guy really? I mean, like, he believes it's there, but he said he had scientific proof. But, I mean, something like that is kind of hard to prove, you know, unless you actually go there and come back. So, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of thought, sounded a little, a little bit like Huey, as Sheldon Cooper would say. Or maybe he would say Hokum. Um, you got anything else? Well, I was a little surprised that I couldn't believe I can't. <laughs> I furthermore don't understand uh, books motivations. I don't know exactly what he thinks he himself is going to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. By crossing the I mean, like, has he completely gone off his rocker? If you wanted to do something about what's going on and make a difference, basically, turn yourself in and try and make a difference with Burnham. But instead, he's going off half cocked again. I'm in a cross the galactic barrier. And then we get all these an explanation of all these horrible things that will happen. And I was like, how did they know? How did they know all this stuff is going to happen? I'm like, what, what proof do they have that all these bad things will happen? So I didn't get that either. Anyway. Well, you just um, triggered my memory to come up with one that I didn't write down. Okay, so we see that Tarka isn't a crackpot. I guess that's one thing that we didn't know because I, I thought he was Looney Tunes. But um, so he's not a mad scientist that he has faith i guess in this alternate universe and knows that it exists but you know okay so an alternate universe exists but how do you know that it's this this wonderful place i mean what if they go there and it turns out to be well it was a wonderful place 500 years ago but now oh boy <laughs> mm-hmm. you know and as i had said before um a few episodes back, it doesn't change who you are. It, it just makes things from that moment on better. And, you know, what if you come across yourself in that other universe? Like, what if, what if the other Tarka 
is in jail. Um, and so Tarka shows up and they immediately, you know, think he's escaped and they put Tarka in jail, you know, <laughs> stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, so anyway, th- there's, there's a whole bunch of questions. Um, I guess uh, we don't know. I mean, for all we know, that alternate universe could be actually on the other side of the wormhole. <laughs> Maybe these beings are from there. Who knows? Uh, who, who really knows? Um, why? The, the one thing I didn't understand really about this episode at all is, so Discovery goes toward the galactic barrier and their their plot is all about going to the galactic barrier and supposedly uh, there's a little bit of talk about them doing upgrades but they don't say anything really about using pro- programmable antimatter um it's not even mentioned on discovery and on bookship the whole thing is about getting programmable antimatter so why the difference like why was it so easy for discovery to start going through the barrier versus book having to you know take an entire episode before they could try i didn't get that at all so i don't know yeah i got nothing and i guess the obvious question is what is so important that kovich is doing yeah you know um is he trying to come up with an alternative method to communication is he in communication with them you know like it's really not explained um i think the only reasonable explanation is much like bryce he's another person that can't be there you know seven days a week so let's put him off ship (laughs) you know Mm. That's that's the reason for him, you know, not not coming there. But aside from that, I couldn't really think of a reason for it. So beyond that, um, I think that's it for my hold your horses. Beyond, you had a lot of good ones there. So I sport the things that you said. Let's move on to our feedback section and open hailing frequencies for a second time this week. Okay, so we have our second voicemail, and it's keeping that streak alive with Jeff, X-Force 11. Hello, Star Trek fans. This is Jeff, X-Force 11, leaving my feedback about the most recent episode of Discovery. I liked this episode. It, for the most part, was a more quiet episode, but the theme of building bridges and communication between rivals and between found family was very, very good. I like the precedent that they're setting of working on communication and building that up before first contact with this new race. And so I appreciate what they're doing and I enjoy most every aspect of this episode and am happy of what they're doing here with us. And I cannot wait to see what's next. All right. Those are my thoughts. X-Force is out. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, X-Force 11, for your feedback. Once again, keeping that streak alive. I have lost count how many episodes now you have uh, sent in your feedback for. So, again, thank you so much. All right. uh, Did you have anything that you wanted to say about Jeff's feedback? Okay, so I don't either other than thank you. Uh, we got one little more, a uh, little more, one uh, little bit of feedback that um, we took from Andy's feedback that came in. Uh, Ruthie, you want to read that? All right. Andy in the Midwest says, did we just spend most of an episode doing something that took about 30 seconds in the TOS episode by any other name? 
I know they first encountered the barrier in Where No Man Has Gone Before, but I don't recall if they passed all the way through it in that episode or not. Coincidentally, I just heard last night that Sally Kellerman, Dr. Elizabeth Denner, from that episode, passed away. Condolences to her family and friends. Um, I think they talked about that in the ready room, and I think they started in on the very first episode that they encountered the galactic barrier and then turned around and took off. Hmm. Interesting. I can't remember what that episode was called, though, other than the fact that they said it was the first time they encountered the galactic barrier. So it may or may not be the episode you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it was pretty, pretty quick. So I don't understand why all the fuss though, honestly, because in every episode they were talking about in TOS, there was not nearly this much stress and trauma going through it. And I mean, a lot of times other people were helping them and whatnot, but still uh, that they were dealing with significantly older technology. So I would have imagined that some kind of I mean, for them to have this much knowledge about what may or may not happen inside the galactic barrier seems like they should be a little bit more advanced in how to handle it. Yeah, you would think so. All righty. That uh, is it for our feedback section. So it goes on to our notes. Ruthie, do you have anything? Nope. Okay. So the only thing I had was I was wondering, you know, we had the first episode was called the Kobayashi. Well, not the, it was called Kobayashi Maru. And I'm wondering now with Rulik being on the ship, if, her Kobayashi Maru, if Burnham's Kobayashi Maru involves Rillick. So it could be like a situation where it's like, who do you save, Rillick or Book? Or maybe it's, who do you save? Um, like, is it saving Rillick and, or not saving Rillick? I don't know. It, it made me think about uh, Rillick versus Book. So because uh, that's what I wonder. It would make sense. If it's that kind of thing, a personal loss versus, uh, you know, a kind of a galactic loss. Cause I, I would think galactically losing Rillick would be a, a bigger loss than losing book. So that's my thought anyway. Okay. So I just had a few things about, uh, spot the references I didn't really write too much um the oversight committee that burnham mentions at the beginning of it um that's a reference to season four episode four all is possible which is the uh episode where that's tilly's last episode um so there's that a three-hour tour outside the galaxy of course that's a reference to gilligan's island um big shock there um but I heard, I don't know who, not sure who did um, Gilligan's Island. It may have been actually a, a Paramount thing. So that's probably why they referenced it. No? Oh, well, yeah, it was, it was actually, yeah, CBS was involved with it. It was, um, it originally was a, uh, was shown on CBS. So, yeah. Anyway, and um, we mentioned, of course, that this is not the the first time we have seen the galactic barrier. Um, also in TOS, we mentioned, of course, um, it's season one, episode three, where no man has gone before. That's the episode with Gary Mitchell and um, Dr. Elizabeth Daner, which just briefly got mentioned earlier, but we'll mention her in a minute. It is also mentioned in season two, episode 22 of TOS by any other name. And specifically it was, uh, Rojan and Kalinda of the Kelvin empire who, uh, originate from the Kelvin or sorry, 
The Kelvins originate from the Andromeda galaxy, and they went through the galactic barrier to get to the Milky Way galaxy. So that's that's what uh, that's how we know them. So anyway. That's beyond that. That is about all that I um, recorded for this episode. Um, let's move on to our uh, open hailing frequency section and get into news. All right. So um, the Ready Room had an extended Picard segment on it. Um, so there were several things on there uh, talking about Star Trek Picard that we hadn't seen before. And uh, that was kind of, uh, I, I'm not going to get spoilery because a lot of people don't like it when you get spoil, spoiled on stuff like this. But um, I thought it was interesting. I learned some things that I didn't know about uh, for season two. And um, I want to get to watch the show so <laughs> i think it's going to be interesting to see where where things go so what about you what about me what um did you watch uh, the ready room or no yeah, i said i watched it i thought you did so what did you think of the picard stuff um i thought i don't know i thought it looked interesting um it looked to it just i don't know i don't know what they're doing i don't know what's going on they looked it looked very different from the end of season one so i guess maybe maybe they aren't exactly interconnected the way that i probably assumed that they would be Mm. so well, as far as I'm concerned, we'll that's a good thing. Um, cause, yeah. <laughs> cause the first, you know, I've gone back and I've watched, um, I've watched Picard a, a few times now and I watched it last, I want to say a month ago. I watched it during the, um, the break, uh, of, uh, you know, when this show was off for a month and it's the same thing that I, you know, had noticed then, and you know, after after Picard season one was over, the first eight episodes we loved, we loved it, and then the ninth episode, it was it was kind of like it fell off a cliff, and um, it just goes to show you, you know, the the execution, you know, at the end, um, if on a one of these, you know, serial type shows, if if they screw up the end. Um, it just ruins it for the whole season. And um, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think, um, you know, with, you know, Michael Chabon, as far as I know, he's a great writer, but I don't think he was a particularly good showrunner. I think it was his first um, time doing that sort of thing. So, um there seemed to be a lot of, you know, kind of working um, last minute kind of thing. And, and I'm hoping with uh, Terry Matalus, uh kind of being co-showrunner, he's done this kind of thing before. He's um, got a Star Trek pedigree as well. Um, and of course, he's got, you know, the 12 monkeys behind him. I think um, I think he's going to be great brilliant show yeah yeah so my, i have i have very high hopes for season two of picard um i have very high hopes for strange new worlds um and i'm hoping that the last three episodes of discovery are um worth it so you know and uh i know we'll see yeah and and i also know that lower deck season three is going to be amazing because it has been amazing first two seasons so that's my opinion <laughs> uh, uh, that's why that's why i, I said just, i know i just don't understand why they're doing their viewing schedule this way yeah like i don't 
I don't understand why there's so much overlap. I oh. mean, can we not spread the goodness out well over the course of many more months? I have more to say about that, Ruthie, in the, in the right. news. Do in tell. Fa- in fact, that was something- I never read the news, so- <laughs> No, this wasn't- <laughs> That's why I'm No, asking. Ruthie, this was not in the news. This was actually an oh. article that- or, I, I'm sorry. This was something that, uh, who posted it? It was Jeff. He posted it um, this morning on mm. our Facebook group. And um, I don't really understand it, but um, I'll get to that in a sec in a minute here. Uh, the only other thing I want to say is. Oh, is that that graphic? I saw Yes, it. it's that graphic. But I'll just just say that they showed a an extended scene from Picard um and that was interesting as well but the guest was yeah, I'm wondering if it's the cold open they always show the cold yeah, open yeah I, I think it might be not always not always they they didn't show the cold open from discovery this week last week on the ready room right if that sentence made sense right anyway but a lot of times a lot of times it is um for this one I don't know for sure if it was but it was like I say it was they didn't show anything for discovery there was no extended scene or anything um sneak peek for next week it was just simply um Picard so maybe there'll be a scene that they release sometime during the week I don't know but mm. it was nothing um the one thing that they did have for discovery was uh, Glenn Hetrick who's like one of the, um, I don't know, they don't call them makeup guys. I think it's like creature designer or something like that. Um, but he's kind of like the Michael Westmore of Discovery, if you want to kind of understand who that is. And of course, Michael Westmore was the guy that designed all the aliens and was the makeup supervisor and all that stuff for all the Berman era Star Trek. And uh, he talked about, you know, kind of like standing on Michael Westmore's footsteps and, you know, how much Star Trek meant to him, you know, the, to to him, this is a dream job. And um, he he's just he loves, you know, going to work every day, doing this stuff for Star Trek. He, he to him, this is a dream come true. And he's a lifelong uh, Star Trek fan. Um, those of you who quibble on things that they've done, just remember he's taking direction a lot of times. So, but then again, you know, like you see different of uh, Ferengi in, in this season of Discovery. Well, you know, it's like 900 years. So, you know, or 800 years, I guess. So it's possible that they could have evolved a little bit. Who knows? Um, but anyway, getting into the news, the first thing I'm going to bring up, since we talked about this in our uh, episode a couple of times about where no man has gone before, Sally Kellerman, who played Dr. Elizabeth Daner in that episode, uh, died this week. Uh, she was 84 years old. And um, aside from that episode uh she's best known to film fans as um the first actress to play major margaret hot lips Houlihan in the uh film version of mash loretta swit was the one who played it in the tv version and uh she got an oscar nomination for that um playing hmm. that role and i remember her she had a pretty distinctive kind of sultry voice and she used to do a lot of uh, commercial work. So you'd hear her, you know, talking about like, I don't know, certain coffee or pantyhose or something. <laughs> I just remember her. I just remember her doing a lot of voiceover stuff. Um, okay. So here's what I'm going to, this is, I moved this story, that story up. It was actually at the bottom. And the one that I, we just talked about, I'm moving to the second spot. So um, it's about the schedule. So, so what we, we've got Jeff uh, X force 11 posted something on our uh, Facebook group this morning. 
uh, Sunday morning uh, about the schedule for Discovery, Picard, and Strange New Worlds. And uh, I'm not sure. Well, we see this says Trek Sphere, so I don't know if this is published from Trek Sphere or what. But um, and I don't by that I don't know if that means it's official. I don't know. We'll see. But this is what I'm seeing here. So we know that there is a three episode overlap that starts next week. Ne- next week, and of course, we're very much uh, aware of it because we're having to deal with it, but it's basically uh, episode 11 of season four of discovery is March 3rd season two, episode one of Picard is also March 3rd and then uh, episode 12 and episode two are March 10th. And then the season finale season four, episode 13 is March 17th as is season two, episode three of Picard March 17th. So then from there, we get, um, I'm not going to read all of these, but it, it basically goes all the way down week to week to week until you get to episode 10, which is May 5th for Picard. And then that's also when we get season one, episode one of Strange New Worlds. That's May 5th. Okay. Now, something very weird here that I don't understand. Uh, Season one, episode two is May 12th. Season one, episode three is May 26th. So for some reason, they're taking a week off between season two and, or sorry, between season one, episode two and season one, episode three. But episodes eight and nine are on the same day. So... I don't really understand this unless this is a typo, but I, I, Ruthie, I I posted or I, I pasted this into the show doc. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like weekly. And then episode three is May 26th. That skips two weeks. And then episode eight and nine are both June 30th. So I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Um, and, Again, I don't, I don't know. Um, it could be a problem. I might be traveling. No, no. It could have to do with something about, um, what do you call it? Something about uh, the, no, I was going to say, well, no, it could have something to do with the Paramount stuff, you know, for all we know, um, mm. like Paramount Plus you know, getting released to different markets, but I don't, I don't know why they're being stupid. Yeah. It's just, it's strange if that ends up being the, the actual, um, release time. If it does, I really don't get it. I mean, we already know that Picard is coming next week, which makes absolutely zero sense to me why they're having two shows airing at the exact same time the same day even i don't get it doesn't make any sense to me like i said why can we not stretch out the goodness like just going straight from one show to another instead they're overlapping this doesn't make any sense to me i don't like it doesn't make a lot of sense to me either um an update to the recently announced kelvin timeline film for 2023 and this i think also goes into the i don't understand (laughs) category um apparently the cast was mostly unaware of this announcement and were surprised by abram's statements and their agents have stated via the hollywood reporter that they may not be able to get their clients to sign up for this film due to their schedules so (laughs) oops yeah. So uh, why would they mention this on, you know, are, are they just trying to bolster up the stock value? And that's I the only no reason. Yeah. Uh, all I can say is somebody over there is whack. <laughs> they are. I. I <laughs> it makes me feel like they don't know what the hell they're doing. 
honestly, with the scheduling nonsense and the whole like, yeah, we're doing another movie. And all the stars are like, that's news to me. (laughs) I mean, they didn't just say we're doing another movie. They said we're doing another movie with all the same people. And all the same people are like, we are. (laughs) So I just. I just it just makes me (laughs) say, what the hell is going on there? And I really just makes me feel like they don't know what they're doing. One must wonder. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me at all, really. Uh, free mobile game is in development called Star Trek Lower Decks. TBD. <laughs> and I guess that's the name of it. TBD. It's not just, um, it's not. To be determined, it's TBD standing for the Badgie Directive. Players will assume, or sorry, sorry, players will use the characters from the TV series to take on a rogue AI Badgie in their attempt to return to the real world. The game is being developed by Canadian developer Eastside Games and Australian developer Mighty Kingdom Limited. You can pre-register for the game. It will be available on iOS and Android sometime this year. Interesting. Uh, La La Land Records has come out with a two-disc remastered soundtrack to Star Trek The Motion Picture to promote its forthcoming 4K Ultra HD restoration of the Director's Edition. They had previously released a three-disc version, which was sold in 2012 and has since gone out of print. Uh, And there will also be a vinyl record of the Discovery Season 3 soundtrack set for release by um, Lakeshore Records in May. It will be a spectacular two-vinyl record set of the third season soundtrack which was the first ever uh, star trek soundtrack to be co- recorded remotely due to pan- the pandemic wow vinyl yeah um in an interview with collider.com picard stars jerry ryan and michelle heard were talking about seasons two and three in that interview they confirmed what they had what had only been Hearsay at this point, even conflicting reports due to the interpretation of uh, SFX magazine article from February that Picard will end after its third season. They stated in the interview that they were at work on the series finale. Okay, so I guess that means three and out, which um, is something that uh, we were told from the beginning and you know, it makes makes sense. You know, it's it's just a three, um, you know, thirty episode, three hour tour, <laughs> <laughs> a thirty hour tour. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, I think that's good to have like a, a starting point and an ending point, and you know, it'll yeah, it's best not to mosey. Yeah. Um. And I know that they were probably also uh, promoting their new audio book or audio drama. Is it called No Man's Land? I think mm-hmm. that's what it's called. Um, and I believe that just came out. I haven't listened to it yet, but uh, it's out there. Um, another thing that is coming soon, it's not out yet, but we have seen. In the last trailer, um, that Guinan has a bar, and it's called, uh, the address is 10 Forward Street. So um, there is a 10 Forward The Experience um, that will be coming March 10th through 20th at 1262 Palmetto Street. And Los Angeles, California, 90013. And you can go to 10 forward the experience.com uh, to look it up. And the, this picture that uh, shows it is uh, it basically looks like a bar with a very funky looking 
table and uh it's looks pretty cool almost looks like i don't know cheers meets star trek (laughs) i don't know Hmm. but uh yeah as far as our paired analytics this week uh we don't have anything new to say about uh star trek uh the number one digital um original show this week is the mandalorian at 44 sorry at 48.8 times the demand of an average show number two also to deal with um same kind of uh mandalorian types (laughs) the book of boba boba fett uh 44 0.7 0.7 times the demand of an average show. So Star Trek Discovery is not rese- represented in the top 10. Um, hopefully it's somewhere in the top 20. But anyway, that's it for our news this week. So Ruthie, why don't you tell people how to contact us and send feedback and give me a second. All right. Um next week to accommodate the craziness of life our feedback deadline for star trek discovery season four episode 11 is going to be thursday march the 3rd 2022 at 7 eastern 6 central which is subject to change as always to submit your theories and feedback, go to talkthroughmedia.com slash feedback, where you can submit text or audio. You can call us at 216-232-6146 and leave a voicemail. Email us at Star Trek Discovery at talkthroughmedia.com. You can post in our designated episode thread in our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash group slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. <laughs> Uh, If you would like to support the podcast, you can like our page on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash talkthroughmedia. While you're there, you can write a review. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Star Trek TTM. Um, Share us on Facebook and retweet retweet us on Twitter, especially when we post that the new episode is out. Subscribe to the Talk Through Media YouTube channel, which is where you'll find our newest episodes first. You can also subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts or the podcast client of your choice. And while you're there, give us a rating or a view. Go to Podchaser, where podchaser.com, where you can rate and review the podcast and even individual episodes. Finally, the best way to help us keep the lights on is to support us via Patreon. And we would like to thank our Patreon supporters, James Robbins, Clint McCollum, Brian Shiro, Michael Carrier, Jeff Gentry, Robert Kaiser, Mike, Trey, Will, Morning Pace, Kim Vogley, Lawrence Todd, Kyle McAdams, Kevin Lyle, and Aaron Vase. All of the podcasts through the from the Talk Through Media Network can be found on the Talk Through Media All Inclusive feed, including Rebinge DS9. Um, the Star Trek Picard cast you'll also find here as well as on its own feed and the walking dead talk through. And speaking of that, Kyle and LT are continuing the walking dead talk through. It just had its um, first episode back. Uh, It will um, be doing another eight episodes for the, the second eight of uh, the second of three parts of season 11 of the walking dead and then um and then fear the walking dead after that so they're doing that so episode covering season 11 episode 9 just came out and they'll be recording episode 10 our next episode will be covering season 4 episode 11 of star trek discovery we don't know the title who's written it or who's directed it but until next time i'm brian And I'm Ruthie. Peace and long life. Live long and prosper. 